Good morning, my brother. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I Happy Friday. Really well. Happy Friday to you. Yeah, it's been, I don't know what you've been doing. I don't know where you are today. I'll have to get asked you that. But yeah, I just got back last night. We were, went to check on some jobs yesterday. So it was a bunch of driving for me. I did, I'm like five hours from Atlanta. So I drive up there and then back, you know, yesterday to check on, uh, check on Jim and Nick's projects that I've Jim been and Nick's, yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, it's going really well. So we did, as you, as I've told you, we were doing, you know, converting some restaurants from full service to fast casual. We've got one, the ones we're doing right now is kind of a, the next step or th they smartly wanted to do it kind of in phases. And so we're doing the next step right now and yeah, uh, just cool. uh, ready to ho hopefully start on some more work with them. So that's, that's cool. Yeah, that's all, it's all the, uh, the drive-throughs, which are very interesting. I'm interested yeah. to hear the feedback on how that all works when they open up and how much of yeah. their business is going through those drive throughs and how that's how that's really impacting their business. So I'm, I'm yeah. interested to hear that. It's great info. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's been fun to work on that. And, you know, I'm kind of looking forward to it. Obviously everybody's doing, you know, ginormous drive throughs with, you know, space age, you know, overhangs and all this stuff. And which is, which is cool to do. And, you know, they were lucky they already had, you know, drive throughs So we kind of just enhanced what they had. So we're, it's been, it's been working well. Um, where great. are you at right now? I am in Bel Air, Florida. Oh, so cool. uh, I, I've escaped uh, the cold of, of New Jersey, and the and the, I feel bad every 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 time I call and talk to <laughs> somebody who's everywhere somewhere because we have guys all over the country. But back in that Northeast corridor, it's uh, I feel bad for them. They've had a tough winter. We haven't had as much precipitation and snow and sleet and and you know. It's, you know, the one positive is during COVID, no people are really moving anyway. So it didn't like affect people going into the office for the most part, but yeah. it still has, you know, obviously transportation and other challenges that presents itself to us. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm in much warmer climates. <laughs> I saw something that said <laughs> this week, everyone hates Florida because it's like the only place, you know, that's warm, you know, today or the last couple of days. Yeah. So anyway, so today we are lucky. We've got Chris Moran, who you and I both know. I met, I first met Chris back when I worked at Redstone and, and, you mm -hmm. know, Chris is just a really impressive guy overall. A, as I wrote, he's, he's one of the smartest people I've ever met, you know, which I didn't realize when I first met him, but man, the dude is, is super sharp and he's been doing consulting for, for a little while now. And so I asked him to come on to talk to him about that. Cause I know he's probably very effective at doing that he's now a portland oregon dude so let's let yeah. him on yeah chris is a great a dude you people will learn i mean chris is super smart like you said i was blessed to be around him since the redstone days and kind of traveled through some other uh concepts with them and learn you know you're gonna learn something at the end of the hour if we, if we just shut up and let's let him talk and let him talk oh, about yeah. the topics he knows he's a, he's and he's a great person as well which again is a common theme of every um, I think every video we do, the people that we're talking to are great people. So, um, and I think people will certainly enjoy Chris today. Well, with that, welcome, Chris. Good to see you, my friend. Good morning, gentlemen. How are we doing? Excellent. Very well. Doing great. Chris is coming from us from Portland, Oregon. We made him get up this morning and well, it's not that it's that early there, but thanks for being on, Chris. We really appreciate your time. It's good to see you. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, thinking of me and including me in your uh, in your series. So thank you. Of course. Well, let's get right into it. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, Chris. Where, where I know a little bit about where you're from and your history, but wh where were you born? I was born Where'd in Brooklyn, New York. Oh, um, grew up in Brooklyn and Staten Island. Uh, and then uh, my dad decided he didn't want us growing up in New York City, so we moved to Connecticut. Um, and that's, I grew up in Old Saber, Connecticut as well. So a little bit of city life and a little bit of, uh, suburban life. So, um, you know, I guess I was just 
typical of any kid growing up in the 70s, um, you know, had a paper route and did a lot of landscaping. And then in the process of uh, doing the paper route, I kind of fell into the restaurant business because the company that I was working for, I had to give away free subscriptions every month to people to get them to try to subscribe. But there wasn't a lot of new construction or people moving in and out. So after a couple of years, people just kept saying like, stop people leaving these newspapers on my doorstep. And uh, so I started dropping the papers off at this restaurant. And I don't know, maybe after two or three months, the owner's just like, hey kid, how much you make work at uh, delivering newspapers? And I told him, he's like, well, I think you should be a dishwasher and uh, I'll pay you 825 an hour. This was 1983, by the way. And uh, I just did the math in my head, I'm like, I'll make more in an hour than I make on the five cents I do delivering newspapers every day. So that's it. That's how I got into it. Um, funny. And that's, that's so funny. You know, like yeah, so many people story. started like as dishwashers. I, I started as a dishwasher too. Which yeah. You probably knew, but yeah. <laughs> so many of us. You know, delivery boy. I, I was a delivery boy. I remember <laughs> my first day I had to peel into vein 60 pounds of 1620 shrimp. And then had to de-beard like two bushels of mussels and clean, I think, two or three bushels of steamers. And then I'm supposed to break down vegetables and uh, starches for the daily veg and the daily starch. And it had to be like 6.30 or 7 o'clock. And I'm already in the weeds with pots and pans and dirty dishes. I don't have like maybe have half of my prep done. Uh, mind you, I didn't know that this was part of the hazing process that if I didn't just up and quit, that they would sh like show me how to do things correctly. <laughs> so, you know, like nine o'clock rolls around, I'm finally done with all the prep and I'm, I'm kind of out of the weeds on, on the rest of the stuff that I'm actually supposed to be doing. And at the end of the night, <laughs> the, one of the owners walked up to me, he said, well, he's like, if that's not gonna make you quit, I don't think there's anything else we could throw at you. So we'll put you on the schedule. And, and the rest <laughs> as they say is history. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. awesome. So where'd you go from there? What, what, what was your first, uh, you know, like what, what, you know, I mean, there's a point in your career for me, it was like, you know, my, my first real, you know, restaurant job after I got, you know, a little bit promoted. Where'd you go from there? Well, I think I got the bug probably the second year I was there. Um, we had hired a chef who was trained at the CIA. His name was Jimmy DeQuilla. He has a restaurant right now in Yorba Linda called The Wild Artichoke. Um, but he really taught everybody in the kitchen about cleanliness, organization, mise en place, anticipating things. Um, you know, it was an 80-seat restaurant. We would turn it over three to four times a night, um, Tuesday through Saturday. So, you know, two guys on the line, one guy on pantry slash salad, who would actually come up and like garnish and stage plates for expo to kind of have things go out to the table at the same time. And then, you know, the dishwasher would either help prep or the dishwasher would help the, the saute guy or the grow guy. Cause those are the two stations played up or, or get mise en place and stage it. So that way they could fire. So it was four man kitchen or four person kitchen. And, uh, the, the place ran like a machine. Um, I wanted to stay there. Uh, we had opened four other locations from 83 to 86 before I went to, to school to, to Northeastern. And, uh, you know, being part of restaurant openings, even as like a line cook, uh, was very interesting to me. And then they turned the original location in Old Saybrook uh, into like a commissary. So we would break down all the fish all the fish that got sent to Rocky Hill or to Canton or Avon or Milford all got broken down in Old Saybrook. And then we, we'd package it up correctly, store it in ice and stage it in a van, um, you know, by location. And then someone would drive around and drop all that stuff off. So that was really cool. And uh, I really wanted to stay there instead of going to school, but um I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I listened to my parents and decided to go to, to school because, uh, you know, working in Boston for me really just kind of uh, set the hook. 
you know, I, I kind of, I just knew I wasn't going to get out of the restaurant business. I tr I've tried a couple times, uh, but I just can't, there's nothing that really, uh, there's no other work that I've been able to find that's as stimulating as rewarding and constantly evolving as the restaurant businesses. Yeah. Um, yeah. So working in Faneuil Hall, we it was insanely busy. There was six people on the hotline, four people on the cold line. The so hotlines at Nathaniel Hall. What what place were you at there? I was at Crickets, which was a Gilbert and Robinson concept, and then uh, some of the principals from GR decided to buy all the one-off. Uh, locations for Gilbert and Robinson, and they turned that into a company called CRM, Creative Restaurant Management. Um, but uh, have, I just had never been in a in a place that was that busy. And the, the hotline spoke Spanish, the cold line spoke French. The expediters <laughs> on either on either side had to be trilingual, and uh, we hired um, track. Uh, track and field people to run all the food because we were in a basement and the first floor and the second floor of the restaurant where we had seating uh it was probably a good you know 12 feet maybe 14 feet in between each story so that's a lot of stairs Jeez. and uh inside i think we sat about 450 with the patios we got close to 600 Damn. and when you're doing two turns for lunch and two and a half turns for dinner that's a lot of plates. Boy, oh boy. You know. Yeah, that's a that's a crazy place. I haven't gone to college up there and I've gone in there from time to time and just seeing how the the hubbub of activity and all the people there. I it's just it's crazy. So what it what a what a break in. What an experience that must have been. Yeah, I mean it was it was interesting because the basement kitchen for crickets was also the prep the prep area for uh, Lily's Cafe, Fred Piazza, and Lily's Piano Bar. So all four of those locations were basically run by the same culinary department. Um, the management teams kind of fo focused on their restaurant, and there wasn't a lot of moving around between restaurants and and uh, Fred Piazza. But you know, back of the house if lilies was in the weeds and we had spare hands we would go over and get lilies out of the weeds and then if uh if they had spare hands and we were getting hammered they'd come over and help us so it was uh it was pretty intense you know saute station was two people we had 16 burners but our pickups were in rondos because our all days were in the dozens Jeez. You know, and we had a Blodgett wow. stack of we had a Blodgett stack oven back in the prep kitchen that was filled with rondos that, that held, were held at 350 degrees. So that way we didn't have to wait for the rondo to heat up and we dropped it on saute. You just call back and say rondo and then the rondo would come up, drop on the four burners and then that's it. You pick up your mussels, you pick up your chicken stir fry, whatever, uh, fettuccine Alfredo, whatever it was. And you just drop everything in the dozens and you just keep rolling. It was fun, and that's where awesome. I, that's where I learned to speak Spanish. I was going to ask. I was just going to ask you that, you know, because yeah. I know you speak Spanish so well. That's obviously you were forced to learn. Yeah, and I had studied French for ten years, so I could read it, write it, speak it. So the guys on the cold line from Morocco and Haiti, I could talk to them because I practiced it every day. Now it takes me, you know, if I'm anywhere where people are speaking French, it takes me a day or two to kind of find all that information because I don't use it very often. Right. Um, so yeah, hmm. crickets was fantastic. And, you know, I think the timing of me going to the Culinary Institute of America was solely based on the economy. Like in 91, um, <clears throat> the economy was struggling. And uh, for me to get a full-time job as a sous chef, I couldn't afford to pay my school loans and pay, afford to live in Boston. And I just figured, <clears throat> all right, well, I can either get two jobs and struggle to try to make this work, or I can double down and go to culinary school while the, while the economy is, is uh, challenged a little bit and see where, you know, kind of see where that lands me. So During the time, uh, once I got out of school, before we went to culinary school, we couldn't really 
start school when we wanted to. There was three other guys I was going to culinary school with. Um, so we decided to drive across country for three months and drove about 20,000 miles, uh, 35 states, and really just had a chance to just taste everything we possibly could. The goal was to hit every national park and every major city in the path that we drove. Um, and it was cool because we really got to see parts of the country and spend time uh, in areas that we probably wouldn't have had we not had that time off between uh, between college and uh, culinary school. Yeah. And uh, that's a great experience. You know, I, yeah. And I never really thought about it uh, until after the fact. But we originally we were going to do Europe, but because of Desert Storm and because of how America was viewed in Europe and in the Middle East, it wasn't really a positive environment. So why would we go there and spend the time and go around and then take a bunch of crap from people? I just figured, you know what, screw it. Why don't we learn about our own country? Why do we have to go to Europe? And that's how that kind of came together. So cool. that's, that's great. Yeah. Culinary school was amazing. You know, and you went to Johnson and Wales. I went to Culinary Institute of America in, okay. in Hyde Park. Hyde Park. Um, I, I looked at Johnson and Wales and I looked at New England Culinary Institute and the challenge that I had with Johnson and Wales uh, was a lot of the credits that I had from Northeastern would not would not uh, transfer. 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 Yeah. And I get it because they want to teach you their their uh, philosophy when it comes to like food and beverage management or hotel management or restaurant management. And there is a degree of specialization. Uh, between general business management and and you know the food service side, I get it, but I couldn't afford to, you know, forgo at the time. I just couldn't yeah. afford to take on another four year school yeah. and carry that debt. I mean, it was it was basically an economic decision. And then then CIA they took all the credits that I I could I could transfer. And some of the classes I still took anyway, because I just wanted to be able to be with my group. Uh, the way Culinary Institute of America works it is you're in a block and there's 28 students or 28 cooks or whatever in each block. And then you kind of go through all of school with that unit. So, Interesting. Um, and some of it too was just nice because some of it was more revisiting information or looking at the same information differently because you're a little bit older you're definitely not smarter and uh you know it, it just it gives you a little bit more perspective i guess um and then after uh after culinary school i was uh i was engaged at the time to my first wife and uh she had a really good job and we weren't going to move so I ended up working as a uh, an apprentice instructor as a fellowship of the American Bounty Dining Room, and that was fun. It was about nine months, and I really learned a lot about uh, presence, like how to carry yourself on the floor, how to kind of read people. Uh, you didn't have to ask people what they needed. You could tell if people were looking around. You all you have to do is look at the table. They yeah. either need silverware or they need their glasses refilled or there's no food in front of anybody. So if you know it's table 10, you run into the kitchen. Hey chef, can I ask you a question? Yes. How, what's the all day on table 10? And then he would tell you, or we're plating it up right now. Or the chef would literally just turn around and hand you, here. here's table 10 right here, <laughs> start running, you know? So a lot of the common sense part of it, you know, we're always, uh, I think I shouldn't say always it's, Typical, you kind of fall into that trap where you're waiting for somebody to show you the right way how to do things or show you like this is our this is our way or this is our approach and this is our system. But a lot of the the beauty of the restaurant business is it's really just common sense. Yeah. Reading and, the room. Uh, like I love yeah. what you were just saying about watching the tables. Cause I'm th that's uh, you probably do the same thing. When I'm in a restaurant. I'm looking at everybody's table to see, and you can tell who the staff are that are doing the same. And it, it's so obvious when they're not, you know, they're not watching the tables they're just missing everything. And, you know, a kid can be walking through the room. Doesn't even really have to have much experience if he's watching the table and asking people what they need and trying to take care of them is going to make a huge impact. So that's, 
Yeah, I always thought that that was kind of the downfall or uh, uh, another trap, like companies encouraging the managers or the floor supervisors or the hosts or maitre d's to touch all the tables when I just didn't see the utility of it when I was a GM. Like, why am I going to go touch all these tables? I'm not doing anything. I'm not giving them water. I'm not running drinks. I'm not running food. Like, I don't want to do that. So I understand the purpose of it. Like, I understand the impact of it, of, of, creating that connection or creating that that uh opportunity to at least identify the guest and and thank them for coming in and thank them for supporting your business like philosophically i get it but uh i guess from a line cook's mentality i'm like i can't walk around with empty hands it's full hands in full hands out Mm -hmm. so i'd always run food or refill water the busters would be like oh am i not doing my job I'm like don't worry about that yeah We had all the bussers make sure that we had the tables clear when I was going to seat another table or the host was going to seat another table. I'm like, do me a favor. Make it look like you're wiping off the booth seat. If the seat's still warm, then we're seating tables at the rate we're supposed to. If those seats are cold, you guys aren't seating people at the door fast enough. (laughs) And that's what I just said to the bussers. I'm like, you don't get paid to fill water. You get paid to bus tables. If you have time, go ahead, but I'd rather do the water. You get the tables. We'll get the sales. Let's just keep this thing going. So <clears throat> teamwork. After, teamwork. Uh, yeah, after culinary school um, and the fellowship, I was, uh, I got lucky. Uh, I called a buddy of mine, Mike Reed, who I had known since the early 80s. Mike and I worked the omelet bar at, at Lily's Cafe on Saturdays and Sundays and we would probably bang out anywhere between four, 600 omelets between the two of us on those little portable <laughs> burners with like the I love those. Paint, I love those spray things. paint cans of, uh, of uh, butane or whatever the hell it was. And uh, we literally made more money and tips on those two days than we did in our paycheck every week. Yeah. And we'd always go back over and people were like, how was the omelet? Oh my God, it was horrible. We were so busy, <laughs> nobody ever wanted to do it. And uh, after a while, we just told people, "I'm like, look, we're making a killing. If you guys yeah, ever want to cover our days off, just let me know. I'll show you how to get. I'll show you how to bang this thing out." And uh, I called Mikey, and I was like, "Hey, man, what are you up to?" He's like, "I'm working for this guy Todd English in uh, Charlestown. There, we're looking for a hot apps guy. Maybe you should give him a call." So. <clears throat> I was like, I don't, I don't want to call this guy. So I, I got home uh, after my shift at the, at the American Bounty and, and uh, told my fiance at the time, I'm like, I'm going to drive to Boston tomorrow on my two days off and go talk to this guy. And uh, so I drove up there, sat in the dining room, uh, waited, I think, until 10 o'clock to get a seat at Olive's. And uh, Todd came, sat down with me. We had a couple of different uh, plates together and he's just like Mike says you know what you're doing and do you know what side of the knife to use and I'm like yeah I, I know this I use the side of the knife that doesn't cut my fingers to cut the food and he's like all right uh we'll have you start tomorrow and that was it worked hot apps for about six months and I would say about a month or two after that, the gentleman who was running the kitchen, Marco Falli, who's just amazing, incredibly creative guy, really kind of the yin to Todd's yang when it came to creativity. They really looked at things differently, but when their ideas came together, they were brilliant. Uh, he kind of took me under his wing and, and uh, taught me a lot about how to work in that kitchen. You know, there's no recipes, no prep list, no line check, just you get shown how to make the stuff and you just have to remember and everyone had little books or, or uh, index cards or whatever to make their notes mm-hmm. on. Uh, but you had to just, you had to know how to cook. And uh, I was really fortunate when Mark left to, to work on his own project that, um, that Todd gave me the, gave me the opportunity to be the chef de cuisine there. And, you know, that interview was even shorter, you know, he's like, we got a 28 in the Zagat guide and we're the number one restaurant in Boston. If any one of those two things change, I have to replace you. Do you want the job? <laughs> I'm like, sure. <laughs> and so Todd's like, well, how do you, how do you plan to do it? I'm like, I'm going to do it the same way you do, dude. One plate at a time. That's it. So 
it was interesting. That place was, uh, it was like graduate school for, for culinary arts. Hmm. You know, we did Olive's Table, the cookbook. Todd was doing like, like radio and TV spots. I don't know how old that, that side of the entertainment yeah. business works or whatever. Uh, we were working on opening figs uh, towards the end of my tenure there. Uh, we were working on uh, Olive's at the Bellagio. And, uh, you know, I had the chance to cook at the Super Bowl a couple times, which was really a lot of fun. So it was very, very interesting. Um, I kind of jumped around a little bit after that. I, I, I was a little disillusioned, I think, because I really thought that I was going to be able to work with uh, Brad Stevens, who came from uh, paparazzi. Uh, he opened up, a, I don't know, probably two or three dozen paparazzis with Joey Simone for uh, uh, Charlie Sarkis at the Back Bay Restaurant Group. So Todd tapped him to open up all the figs. And I was just hoping I would be able to get involved with that because I really like the restaurant opening process, the just yeah. how to get all those bits and pieces to kind of fall in together in time so you can start training and then you can open to the public. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, it just it didn't work out. I think Todd just wanted me to stay at Olive's because I had that down on lock and he didn't want to have to train somebody else to replace me. But I didn't yeah. have the awareness to really kind of drill into that. I was kind of stuck on my path. So I ended up uh, leaving and going to run a few restaurants and a private club and a commissary in the Cape. And that really just beat the crap out of me. We were doing half a million to three quarters of a million dollars in sales a week from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Yeah. And then we would do just functions from Labor Day to Columbus Day weekend. And then I was kind of on autopilot doing like fresh prepared food and, and, a, and developing a frozen food line for a grocery store. Then come January, February, you start making ice cream for the ice cream shop because we had a freezer that was literally the size of like a, an aircraft hangar. <laughs> We'd get all the ice cream made February, March, and halfway through April for the entire season. Wow. Uh, wow that was just crazy. And it was really more about being ready for season than it was about execution and about quality. Like the quality wasn't bad. And the execution wasn't bad, but it was not fun. Yeah. So I dropped that like a hot rock and moved to Maine. And that's where I really learned about local sourcing. Like we sourced everything locally with the exception of like four to six weeks out of the year. We had to buy things on the commercial market because there was just no way to get certain uh, produce items or certain uh, protein items because it was just too cold or... Uh, just not the right time to harvest certain things. So uh, that I really enjoyed. And we came up with this crazy idea, myself and uh, Jason Waring and Lee Skowinski and Theda Leiden and God, Sharon. Sharon's going to kill me if I can't remember Sharon's last name. She was the pastry chef and Andy Omo. We just decided we were going to focus on uh, improving our rating from three star three diamond to four star four diamond and it took us 18 months <laughs> and the goal really wasn't to achieve it the goal was to just get better and if we did achieve it and we got recognized for it that's great but we didn't really live or die by it and it was it was definitely not fun all the time but it was it was great um that was really a cool place and then, unfortunately, um, my personal life changed. I got divorced, and uh, then I just kind of went on a on like a professional hiatus for like two and a half years and worked with a buddy of mine, uh, Alan Bonnert, in uh, in Massachusetts in Swampscott. This place called Red Rock Bistro. Uh, the guy who owned it, Paul Petersil, and his wife Louise, uh, were regular guests at Olives. Paul owned uh, Trabatu Sheik's hummus and right foods which was like a salmon and caviar importing business or what have you so i worked with them for a while and then just kind of pivoted thinking i wasn't really getting enough out of my uh out of my business education so i worked with a headhunter for the first time uh the elliott group and connie paris uh 
was really helpful with helping me really look at what my skills were, what my experience is, and uh, how I could leverage that to, you know, to help companies grow. And she ended up getting me placed with Not Your Average Joe's, which I was there for about three and a half years. Uh, opened Beverly, opened Lexington. I got Hyannis probably to like the 20 yard line. And then I got pulled out of Hyannis to go back to Beverly to run that location as the, as the company's first training location. Cause we, I started with them, we had eight locations. And then by the time we left, we had, I left, we had 13. So at that point they wanted to get everybody to go through like one training location to get some level of continuity and training. Um, so I felt like I was pretty lucky to get that responsibility. Uh, and, you know, it's nice to get the accolade, but at the same time, too, you're still responsible for training all these people. You need to do a good job. So there's a there's two sides to that coin. Um, and then Redstone. Redstone was a really uh, – uh, looking back on it, I guess it wasn't as much of a long shot as I thought it would be. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Ron Stockman from Nation's Restaurant Search – or National Restaurant Search uh, was introduced to me by Tim Soufan, who was the uh, Vice President of Food and Beverage for Not Your Average Joe's. <clears throat> and Tim kind of shepherded me through that, that process and gave me a lot of background on Dean and some background on Larry. He didn't know Larry as well as he knew of Dean. And, uh, you know, I was one of 10 people, I guess, I, you know, even if I was one of five, there was many people I had heard that interviewed for the job and I either really did the best job or I was the least expensive or both. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and, and Redstone, I think is really where I honed uh, my, my purchasing skills, like purchasing uh, in some of the smaller companies I worked for was definitely not an afterthought, but purchasing was, was it, it seemed like it was more guided on cost per ounce and savings and, and how much you can improve your margin than it was about buying the best quality you can afford first and then leverage your spend and leverage the relationship over time so you can mutually benefit and pull the inefficiency out of the relationship. So you're never really sacrificing the guest experience or the, the standard of the ingredient. Um, and that's probably where I think Larry and I were able to just kind of hit it off and just hit the ground running because, you know, from my perspective, I didn't want to buy something that was cheaper just because it was cheaper. And um, he had really high standards, I think, uh, as a person. I mean, granted, Dean had very high standards and that's what Dean taught us. And really kind of, uh, you know, managed vigorously. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I mean, Dean wasn't necessarily militant. He was definitely in his own, he was in his own sphere. You know, like it, it, some days you could get through to Dean and the other days you're just like, I just, I can't talk to this guy. I know it's, I know he's not going to remember. This is not what he's focused on. You know, he wants to go, you know, muck it up at lunch with topsoil at the bar in Minnetonka. And D Dean's like, he's checked out today. So whatever this is, I need to talk to Dean about. I'll talk to him about it tomorrow. Right. You know, and I can kind of relate to that, too, because I don't know if Dean had ADD, but I do. And uh, so there's some days where people you don't are like, hey, know guys. whether Dean had ADD. Is that what you just said? Yeah, 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 yeah. And he was on Ritalin, dude. Come on. I mean, you know, I love Dean, as you know, but you know, yeah. He, but no, the dude seriously, you know, had to like hold his head straight. Go, okay, man, we're going to talk about this right now, and I need you. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. Stacy. Um. But before so, yeah. you go on, because this is where you and I met each other, Red, tell tell people a little bit about what Redstone is, uh, because it is a, a a pretty amazing small little company, or it was. Well, I mean, it still is to a certain extent. Um, well, I, to me, Redstone is like cute as Hillstone on steroids, basically. You know, it's a wood fired grill, wood fired rotisserie. Um, there's a lot of similarities in the design, 
uh, interior design and exterior design to the restaurant from the guest perspective yep. on what a Hillstone, Houston's, Gulfstream, Cowboy Seafood would be or Bandera. And uh, in the back of the house, it's probably 200% larger than a Houston's back of the house because our menu was four times or three and a half times the size of Houston's. Yeah. So I think in terms of presentation, plateware, the recipe builds, uh, a lot of the prep, how things were compartmentalized for restaurants that did that kind of volume. I mean, to run restaurants with an average unit volume of like 9 million is not a simple process. You can organize it and you can recommend what people should do to stay ahead or at least, or at least maintain inertia. But, uh, it's one of those deals where you just, you can't get behind, you know, something can't lapse. If you got 86 something for a day or two, fine, I get that, but it can't be any longer than, a, than, you know, two or three shifts. Um, and I think part of the excitement about Redstone was the growth, um, potential was the growth trajectory. It's part of the reason why I left not your average Joe's because, you know, I, I kind of felt like um, there would be an opportunity for me to be able to go into like a uh, an area director position or, or a regional culinary position or whatever. But, you know, in fairness to all the other people that have been with Joe's since inception or shortly after the second or third location opened, there was a lot of people there that knew a lot more about the brand uh, than I did. And they got first... Uh, they got first right of refusal in those positions, which that's the way it should be. If they're the best people for the job, then good for them. And I should go create the same opportunity for myself elsewhere. So I felt pretty fortunate about ending up at, uh, at Redstone. But, um, you know, after Marlton opened, which was like six weeks after I started, they oh, opened wow. at a budget of like, what, 160, 170 a week. And their first, Three weeks, I think they averaged about 220. It was incredibly busy. And it took us about a month to get our arms around that. That's how busy the place was. So, and then I think uh, you know, when when you came on board, Andy, we were we were doing what Chevy Chase, Livonia, um, looking at trying to value engineer, getting all the broilers into all the kitchens because we had to, we were, we were switching the steaks to dry age steaks. And then, uh, you know, I think Plymouth meeting came on the radar shortly after that too. Yeah. Plymouth meeting was just, was under construction when, or, you know, when I believe it was either under construction or almost, um, you know, it, it was, cause I remember going there, you know, it was one of the, like you, the, the sales to me reason was the potential growth. You know, we had a new CEO who was somebody that I had worked with at famous Dave's and there, there was, you know, sales were so high and, and it looked like, wow, you know, this is something that we could, you know, really grow. And so, yeah, it was really exciting. It was fun to be part of for a little while. For sure. For sure. And, you know, uh, things kind of ran their course at Redstone. You know, we, uh, we didn't meet the growth trajectory that we wanted. Um, I think there was some <laughs> lack of focus in terms of growing Redstone versus working on the other concept that Dean wanted to work on. And I get, there, I get there the was a little bit of that. I mean, there was a little bit of that. I, I, my, my take, you know, in, you know, I was working for David and Dean at the time. And of course, Dean was, as you know, trying, we were trying to open up the other stuff that we were working on. We had a, a, that place in the, the two, two con two locations and one in, in Minnesota and one in Florida. And that was definitely distracting him um, from it. But really you and Larry were running Redstone. So, I mean, other than him going there to complain about how thick the pie was, you know, the, 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 you know, the crust on the key lime pie, which we continue to joke about today, you know, he, 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 he you guys didn't need him. I mean, you know, you and Larry were running the business and it was doing really well and, you know, di di didn't really need his, him daily. And of course, then they had David Gronken who came on to really grow the concept. And unfortunately, a bunch of bad things happened all at once, you know, the, the, the economy, you know, went into the toilet, of course, and in 2000 and, and right around that time was when the housing markets, you know, really blew up right after that, I guess. But really, it was Dean's legal problems, which, you know, were not 
uh, people ask me this, they probably ask you this all the time as well. Did me, did Dean know that was going on with his friend? I'm still convinced that he didn't because, you know, knowing Dean, he, I don't believe he knew anything about what Tom Petters was doing at, at all. And that, that's, you know, I, I could be completely, I could be totally wrong about that, but that's my take. Cause I, I remember how he was just so shocked, you know, that it took place. It was like, he had no, uh, no clue. So I mean, I, I, I look at it this way, speculation, you know, we can, we can do it. We can not do it. I just look at it. The easiest way for me to look at it is, is bad things happen to good people. Um, I also believe in karma. So, but I, I do not believe that what happened with Dean was karma. I think it was just, you know, bad things happen to good people. Who's the um, good person there? Just, <laughs> I'm kidding. That was probably that's a bad joke. Well, I mean, look, everything's perspective, right? So, um, you know, I think part of what, what drives good companies is that you hire people that have experience and are willing to offer suggestions or offer ideas that may or may not, uh, you know, resonate with the popular idea at the time. Yeah. And it's not about being, uh, you know, different or differentiated or unique or any of that nonsense. It's just more like, is this really the right way to do it? And if it is, then we're committed to it. But we also need to be realistic that once we have the experiential awareness of doing this this way, which we think is the right way, there's always going to be a different way to improve it because we're all going to have the experience of doing it together. There's always a way to make something more efficient or easier or more fun. So, you know, and part of that uh, part of that, too, was I think that, you know, the GMs and the executive chefs at Redstone were willing to challenge the ideas, but not challenge them for the sake of being anti-change or against change or, you know, like to quote Seinfeld, like, who are the wizards at the corporate office that came up with this idea? You know, <laughs> like we we always tried to vet things uh, logically. You know, Larry will tell you the ketchup story about how they changed ketchup at uh at champs and how it was a debacle and uh uh my debacle at redstone was the was the merry meeting farms chicken like we looked at something that we thought was commensurate to merry meeting farms and uh it wasn't because the chickens we were getting from them were between three and a half and three and three quarter pounds even though they were only charging us for three and a quarter pounds and the chickens that we were looking at were between three and three and a quarter pounds so we ended up losing on a yield basis about 30% uh, on weight, on edible portion. So that lasted about three weeks. <laughs> and I took my lumps because Larry doesn't mind if you make mistakes, but he was mad that uh, I didn't check the math as well as I should have because he had really high expectations of me because at the time um, I had ended up saving a significant amount of money on seafood by contracting it through different... Uh, different sources than what we were currently using. And, uh, you know, we learned that I should double check my work and he should double check my work. So we don't have to double check each other's work after the fact. <laughs> <laughs> good um, lesson. That's a good lesson learned. It, it is, it is. But then that also, that also kind of opened the door of a lot of other ways that we ended up saving money. Like we had been buying this one ingredient from a supplier since long before I joined the company. And when I was in the process of doing yield tests on ingredients, because we were getting ready to roll out crunch time, you know, I discovered that this, uh, this oven dried tomato was short packed by about 10%. And then if you look at the run rate over, you know, a 12 month basis of, you know, five or 6,000 cases, we're missing 10%. That's 500 cases. Significant. Yeah. Uh, Right? Or is that 50 cases? No, that's 500 cases. And uh, so I called them up and I'm like, look, here's the deal. It says it's 48 ounces on the outside of the container. I don't have 48 ounces in the container. You can pull any lot number you want. I've got five. And you can do your own QC test. Or we can save each other the time, fix the pack size, make sure I'm buying what the package says I'm buying. But in the interim, I need 500 cases or I'm, or I'm going to report this. So magically we got 500 cases and you, this might sound familiar to you, uh, Andy, 
you know, I get the phone call from Marlton. What am I going to do with a hundred cases of these tomatoes? dude? <laughs> right. I'm like, well, you've got outside storage, you know, don't thank me for giving you a hundred free yeah. cases of sun dried tomatoes. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> so I, and I think that's where, uh, Chris, I'm Larry... too deep at the bar. I don't have time for this. Exactly. If it's three deep at the bar, dude, they're looking to get a drink. How am I well, supposed to get them a drink? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why don't you just hire more bartenders? No, I'm uh, crazy. <laughs> Andy, you're out of your mind. So, uh, and I think that, you know, once I got to Kona, that's where I really started to look at the importance of collaboration between procurement and menu development and procurement and beverage development because we're all getting bits and pieces of the same puzzle. Nobody really knows what the puzzle is going to look like when you're done putting it together. Yeah. And then the beauty of the restaurant business is as things evolve so quickly over time, that picture of that puzzle is constantly changing. Yeah. But you just have to have the fortitude uh, or the stick to itiveness to just say, okay, even though this picture is going to change over the course of my career, I still have to try putting pieces of the puzzle in it to see if I can get a clearer picture. Hmm. You know, hmm. or it's like a movie script. Restaurants always start differently and end differently, but this, the middle is always the same. The script is always the same and the actors are always different. So it's just, uh, it's interesting where you hear you're part of these growth companies and then they kind of go sideways or some of them just like no longer exist or they get absorbed into other companies. And there's typically that one point where the, like the economy changes or there's a problem with safety or sanitation in the restaurant yeah. and they get bad press or whatever. There's always that one, you know, event that you can't possibly anticipate, but if you're always preparing to be able to pivot or you always have the awareness of, just because we're really successful today doesn't mean we're going to be that way forever. Yeah. And you have that level of like uh, reality. Uh, I think that those companies that, you know, appreciate where they are and try to do everything they can to keep people and to make sure that their guests know how important they are. Those are the companies to me that seem to stand the, te the test of time. Um, and then I think, you know, for me, Kona was just, insane how how much i was able to learn how many restaurants we opened and the team that we put together and how successful we were for i would say a good six six and a half years uh and then you know we we hit some difficult headwinds and it was really challenging to try to figure out you know what to do with these underperforming locations and you know as a company we decided to stick with them um which i I don't regret because I believe in, you know, s sticking with the plan, but at the same time too, if we had made this tough decision and closed two or three of them, instead of keeping all five of them open, you know, the company might be in a different position today. Hmm. So. Yeah. It's tough to, tough to know in hindsight, obviously. Yeah, and it's obviously, you know, it's a pub, that company was in and out of some difficult leadership and different, you know, ownership changed and, and went back and, uh, a very challenging environment, I'm sure, because at the top, if there's no consistency at, at, at the very top of the organization setting the very difficult for someone like you to, you know, maintain a, uh, you know, to, it, it was probably difficult to have a good attitude there, you know, just because it's a tough place, you know, with the tough leadership. Yeah, it was, it was challenging to pivot between the changes in leadership and such, but I, at the end of the day, you know, uh, if you focus on your results and ask people what's important to them uh, and then kind of take what's important to the new leader and kind of weave that into how you can maintain your results so you can adapt to your environment. It's not easy, but it is a way to start. Yeah. So. Um, so you've had a lot of really interesting and, and, and visionary type of guys, you know, you know Todd English and, and Dean Vallajos and uh, and the various guys. Did you did you find a personality trait, Chris, dealing with 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 these people? Uh, did you see anything similar? Did you take something from each and every person along the way to kind of help develop your own strategy? As you now you know you're a little bit further along in your career. I, I you know I think I I was fortunate enough to get uh, valuable information from everybody and experience. Um, 
I think that anytime you're innately curious and you're willing to like just be brutally honest and admit like I have no idea what that is and you need to show me or I'm not going to pretend to understand what you're talking about so uh, I've, I've, I've been on the other side of that I understand those questions very well coming from you you know <laughs> or like when when the when the guy was installing the 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 two drawer grill in Plymouth meeting explaining to me about the gas pressure problem and I'm like well that's great you know but what temperature do you want your steak and if I can't make it to that temperature, am I supposed to tell every guest it's because you guys installed the grill and we have a gas pressure problem? No, fix it. You yeah. know, simple. Um, you know, Todd to me was basically like um, Merlin. <laughs> you know, the guy could just like, you put ingredients in front of him, he could just come up with things that nobody would think of. And working with him and, and, and Mark Arfali and then all the guys on the line or like Barbara Lynch would come and babysit us when Todd went to Nantucket uh, for five weeks a year because Todd trusted Barbara to maintain um, quality. Or uh, <clears throat> trying to remember the other guys, but I, I, it's just escaping me. The guy from Shea Henri, um, you know, that to me was like, it's all about the food and make sure what you put on the plate is at a very high level in terms of presentation and flavor combinations and intricacies and, and taking different types of cooking steps, whether it's texture or braising or grilling or charring or smoking and trying to put all those together in a harmonious manner. And there's plenty of things we tried that fail, but the, of, of the things that were successful, they were wildly successful and it was great. Um, I think that um, the Culinary Institute of America really showed me that it's not about you and it's not about your ingredients. It's about where you are in, in on earth, like where you are physically and how the ingredients and all the beverages that are developed in all these little uh, micro um, areas of the world, how that kind of evolved and affected everybody else. Cause you know, 10 years ago when everyone's saying, oh my God, farm to table is amazing. And it really isn't because before the interstate system was developed in the fifties and before trains were started, everything was farm to table. Yeah. You know, before refrigeration and before preservation, everything was farm to table. So it's technically not new. And uh, so that's what I really enjoyed about the hair seek it in. And Nancy Gray, who was the owner, you know, she was just, unwavering <laughs> and she had a vision she grew the hotel from like 10 rooms to 90 she added 10 condominiums to the hotel she added a 500 seat banquet room to the hotel i remember my first year there we did not use the the fine dining room i mean the the ballroom to do um thanksgiving we did maybe eight or nine hundred covers which is decent in six hours but then the next season, I'm like, screw it. We're going to do a whole buffet line in the, in the ballroom. And uh, we're going to try to see if we can we can beat 100 covers. And that year, we did like 1,300. And then the year after that, we did 16. Uh, so I think it's just like looking at what people are focused on and then supporting what they're focused on in a, in a, in a complementary manner is really where what I learned from, uh, from Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of brings up, you know, you're starting to talk, talk about how you relate, you know, your experience to how you process, you know, now and how you help people. Um, you know, I want to get into your consulting business. You started consulting, you know, a, a while ago. How long you've been consulting and tell us about what caused you to go in that direction for your career and, and how that's been going so far. Well, I mean, to, to, to me, it, I started consulting the same way I started in the restaurant business by accident. Uh, I had been, you know, we, you develop a network of people that you could just call up and then just make it plain. Like, here's what's going on. What's going on with you? Is there any similarity in any of this crap that's happened between the two of us? And then how do we really think we should break it down and approach it? You know, whether it's COVID or it's, you know, the economy or competition or whatever it is. And I'd been kicking the tires on, on some stuff uh, leading up to like April. And I had moved to Portland to work for a company called Sustainable Restaurant Group, 
which was similar to Kona in terms of it was kitchen and sushi. Uh, but it was definitely at a much different level. It was more Japanese with American influence versus Kona Grill was American with Japanese influence, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was talking to a couple of uh, like Japanese ingredient importers and distributors, and we were throwing around ideas on, you know, sustainable couldn't really take a bite out of what their import or their production velocity was, but we could use that as a springboard to introduce that to other uh, like uh, menued concepts. And then I got a couple of calls from, from folks that were in like the Redstone style of the restaurant uh, sector. And, you know, we were talking about protein positions or we were talking about like uh, produce positions or whatever. And a guy called me up that I'd worked with for a long time, Francis Gonzalez, who's the corporate chef for uh, Parker Restaurant Group and said, hey, we're looking at bringing on a consultant and I think you should bid. I said, okay, well, what do you need? And he's like, well, we don't have anybody doing procurement. I'm like, all right, I got it. So, you know, Francis is doing the food side. He's got a, another guy that is on his team named Greg Innocent, who's doing the beverage side. But, you know, we're leaving a lot of uh, efficiency in the B2B relationship on the table because a lot of the folks on the other side of the table are entry level and they're not necessarily aware of everything that's going on behind the scenes. And then when you're running eight or nine restaurants during the process of COVID and having to pivot between opening and closing or running at a reduced inside seating capacity yeah. or only take out and delivery and blah, blah, blah. You know, there's no time to really kind of cultivate those relationships. So yeah. they were the first client I started with in June of 2020, like two months after I left uh, sustainable restaurant group. And then, you know, Andy, I saw the question, like, what do I, what do I focus on or how do I try to help people? Or what do I like about it? And then what do I like least about it? It's <laughs> it, it's really just, I. it's like, I kind of wish it was that simple to answer those questions, but like, it's like any other human being in your life. Like you have to really kind of develop the relationship or kind of get to know them over time and find out what they're interested in or what they enjoy or what they excel at. And then how do you complement what they excel at? And then once you kind of build that connection, then you can kind of show them things that they're not aware of, that they shouldn't be, but you want to make sure that what they're not aware of interests them, because if they're not interested in it, you got to find something else. You know, uh, like Andy, from your perspective, or Brian, from your perspective, like we can certainly look at design and how to make the kitchens more labor efficient, and we can look at equipment to make it easier to execute the menu items uh, over a long period of time. But if your audience isn't interested in that and they just want to buy the best quality ingredients, then you may spend a little bit less on design. You may spend a little bit less on equipment because that money is going to be spent on ingredients. You can still make the sale. You can still design it. But if it doesn't resonate with your audience, there's really no reason to focus on it. Yeah, so, right. you know, to me, Correct. it's like, being able to look at their systems. And that's really where I try to start with everybody. Give me a PL, give me trailing 12 months, give me the same PL year over year. And then you kind of look at what the delta is between some of the cost lines. And then you don't really focus on the highest delta first, because some of that's just commodity cycle. You just kind of look at, okay, how much of this is waste? How much of this is over prepping or over purchasing? And you look at the simple areas first. And then from there, you look at how to harvest the efficiency out of the B2B relationship. If you can get three produce deliveries a week and three seafood deliveries a week instead of six, that's 50% less invoices. It's 50% less inventory rotation. And it's 50% less time spending to either execute the order online or call it in or fax it in or email it in or whatever. Take, get rid of all the redundant steps in the system and then leverage that with your partner, prove you can actually perform at that level for 90 days, which is basically what we did at, at, at Hampton. And at the end of quarter four, which was basically six months later, we pulled $420,000 worth of inefficiency out of cost of goods. Yeah. Uh, granted, I don't take any credit for any of that. Like, it, I mean, from a, from a, a consultancy basis obviously i want to say oh my god this is amazing i did all Look this crap, we did. I, yeah. I didn't do any of it 
All I simply did was show all the people that play a small role, an important role, but a small role in all of these steps in the process, how they can impact saving time on their own workday, but then also saving their vendors time. And because of that, it also makes the complementary effect or the, 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 uh, <coughs> the collateral improvement to me is that once everybody knows you're paying attention, they do everything they possibly can to try to help you achieve your goal. It's not like they were keeping the money before or they were neglecting being a responsible partner. It's just that they've got too many things to focus on too. Yeah. And if you can take excess capacity uh, six days a week on a delivery and then take that excess capacity and, and condense it down to three deliveries a week, they have new capacity that they can then offer to another oh, customer. Would. Yeah. So it, it, to me, it takes the chaos, it, it doesn't take the chaos out of the system. It, uh, it minimizes the frequency of chaos. <laughs> <laughs> So, That's, I, I, which I is like, efficiency. I, yeah, I like the way you explained that because you know it's it's uh, uh, it's like saying in in one way I want to say what you just said is you're 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 teaching people how to be a good customer to their vendors so that their vendors then have time to help them. You know, yeah. it's, as you said, they're or, not. Or I mean, look at it this way: if you want to be a good restaurant to your paying customers, you need to execute consistently. Mm -hmm. You need to offer the portion that you say you're giving them. Mm -hmm. And you need to do that on a basis that they can rely on you to go to your restaurant for every single important occasion, but then every other casual occasion. You know, I'm a, as a chef, I'm a creature of habit. I would much rather go to the same place yeah. and sit at the same table and never read the menu and tell the GM or the chef or the server, like, here's, here's the copy of my check last time. I don't want any of this. Just bring me something different. <laughs> but don't bring me the three hundred dollar, you know, Wagyu tomahawk steak because that's not why I'm here. Yeah, you know. So, <laughs> if you treat your vendors the same way, then they look at you as a partner that versus a customer. Yeah. And then, you know, if you can get the relationship with your vendors to the point where, you know, <laughs> don't tell me about EDS and why I can't get shrimp in six months. That's not my problem. Your problem is to cover my forward position so that I have access to the 250 to 500,000 pounds of 7190 shrimp that I need because I'm giving you first right of refusal for the period of the contract. So if you can't cover that and you're going to give me this whole act of God nonsense, which is fine, you have the right to do that. You're also saying indirectly that you have no control of your environment. So therefore, I can't rely on you as a vendor. Yeah. Well, that's not a fair assessment. Well, how is it unfair? You, you can't tell me that every shrimp farming area of the entire world or every wild place you can harvest shrimp is having EDS. <laughs> and you can't say that that's the only place you're getting shrimp. So either get me samples that I can test so I can get ahead of this, or I have to replace you. Yeah. Which means I'm taking all my focus off of all the other ingredients I need to buy. I'm taking my focus off menu development, whether it's for food and beverage, or I'm taking focus off of keeping my relationship with the corporate chef, the corporate sushi chef, the regional culinary people, uh, the regional culinary chefs, the district managers, you know, I, I'm running behind on everything else because somebody dropped the ball on shrimp. So I think once you can get to the point where people know that every morning that they wake up, they don't have to guess if they have first right of refusal at your business for the next three months or three years. Um, they're willing to, they're willing to get really efficient. Yeah. you know get hungry they get hungry doing it right they don't they don't take your business for granted they they come yeah. to they come to you with fresh ideas and, and new opportunities exactly. every time you talk yeah and I, 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 I would rather I, and i always try to marry or consolidate what the company goals are with what their goals are and then if they have a top 10 list and i have a top 10 list let's just focus on where we overlap even if it's only one yeah. let's start there first you know because at least that way we're our intent is to collaborate and offer people the ability to, to generate a uh, mutually beneficial results yeah. versus, you know, <clears throat> I kind of qualify every human being as two things. You're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. You know, Love that. 
you can't be half pregnant. You're either all in or you're not. <laughs> so um, if you're part of the solution, it doesn't mean you're always part of the solution. It means that your character, your, your, uh, your wiring is to always try to produce a better result or collaborate with people so that they can produce a better result. Or if you're the type of person that feels like you can do something better than everyone else, uh, you're really kind of part of the problem because you're negating everybody else's experience that you could glean from to make your life better or make your life easier or both. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, you know, a, a lot of procurement to me has nothing to do with negotiation. It has everything to do with trust. Hmm. Can I go back to my boss and tell my boss that these guys are going to add 23 restaurants in three and a half years and they're going to grow our business by a minimum of 100%. And can I leverage that volume on the front end, knowing that they're going to buy the whole way through versus after the end of the first year or the second year, some other company's going to come in and underbid me and I'm going to lose the business. Yeah. Because a lot of people underbid because they're trying to steal the business. Well, they're trying to value engineer the business, but then you end up giving it back in year two and year three because yeah. they take automatic price increases yeah. or they come back to you in six months and they're like, magically, there's market conditions that make it that we can't honor the contractor. <laughs> we'll have to dollar cost average your inventory, Chris, because blah, blah. It's all bullshit. So to me, it's like, I have to be able to trust the person I'm negotiating with and they need to be able to rely on the fact that I'm going to stick to my word. Hmm. And- I'm fortunate that I've been incredibly consistent, uh, not always necessarily enjoyable, <laughs> but I've been consistent. And if, I, if I'm not going to hit the target, then I do everything I possibly can to feature the ingredient or de deplete the ingredient on happy hour or give them the opportunity to sell it to another customer if they've given me first right of refusal of, of access to the inventory so that we're, I'm not hindering the efficiency of the relationship that I'm fighting so hard to improve. Yeah. I would guess you spend a lot of time just kind of interviewing potential vendors to see if they can get to that place. You know, I would imagine you have a hard time finding people who can think that far ahead and understand really what you're saying. Because unfortunately, a lot of those vendors are probably not first of all, they're not as smart as you are. So and they're not really viewing that sales trans, that sales relationship in the, the same way you are. So I, I would guess you have to spend a lot of time training them. Here, here's how I look at this. So don't give me this, you know? Yeah. So I, I, you know, it's challenging because, you know, you have the oligopolies in the, uh, in the restaurant industry that really look at you as an essential part of their plan. Yeah. But, you're not as important to them as they are to themselves. And then as a result, they're doing you a favor by selling you their bag in the box. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's challenging, uh, yeah. but it's not insurmountable. It's just more a matter of uh, if it takes three years to get a contract done with a company and you're upfront about the fact that every month that they waste of your life trying to negotiate the contract is going to cost them $10,000. At the end of 36 months, if you end up with a check for $285,000, not the $360,000 you want, it's 100% better than zero. Right. <laughs> right. Or you look at other companies that are not in, I mean, God bless the companies that are, uh, subsist in an oligopoly environment, like the distributors and some of the larger ingredient vendors, like they got there. So they should enjoy the, the station that they created and good for them. It doesn't mean I need to like it. Um, I appreciate it though, kind of, uh, <laughs> not really. And, uh, I kind of, I would, I prefer to look at companies that, that value quality and value, um, their own, uh, reputation, because that means that they're going to always make sure that whatever they're selling is right. And if it isn't right, they're going to be willing to fix it because their reputation is as important to them as the quality of their ingredient. Mm -hmm. So to your point, Amen. Andy, it's not so much interviewing people. It's kind of just filtering through yeah. the folks that are, is this a sale? Because you've got three containers that you don't want to pay cold storage on and you want to dump them into the market. Yeah, I don't need that. I want somebody that I know that I can access their inventory that they're producing every month for the foreseeable future 
so that we can grow our business and not have to worry about what's coming in the back door. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, yeah. I guess, you know, as far as your mindset, Andy, about how you kind of just jump in and start helping people, that's exactly what I do. Um, I don't see the value of like giving people like bits and pieces or trying to like, I, I'm, I'm not a long line fisherman. I'm not going to put out like, you know, 50, 100, 300 miles of hooks and bait and try to figure out who I'm going to catch. Uh, I would much rather, you know, have the clients that I have now who appreciate my experience and that I don't waste their time trying to sell them on what I can show them how to do. I just kind of look at their operation and show them areas that I think that they could focus on improving, which would require little to no effort. It's just a, you know, a small adjustment to their system. Um, and then see if they're interested in coming on as a client because, you know, like the, the company that Francis works for, like I never set a savings goal. I never told them what I could save or what I could produce. I just said, you know, this is my monthly rate and we should start out with 90 days and see if we can, you know, work through some efficiencies to make sure it's mutually beneficial. And then from there we can build on that foundation. You know, was I happy with the fact that we saved over 400,000 out of cost of goods in less than six months. Absolutely. But I, I try not to get, you know, what do they call that? Irrational exuberance. Like it's all that is, is progress. It's not good or bad, but then how do you maintain it? How do you take those wins? And then how do you reallocate those resources to paying your vendors earlier and getting terms or making sure that your vendors know that because you save this money, that you appreciate the relationship and what else can we do? What other new products can we look at? Or what specs do you have that are more cost-effective that we can use so we can continue to, to value engineer the relationship without taking uh, profitability out of their equation or ours? Yeah, yeah. Helping both, uh, helping both and letting them know that you're open to that, you know? Yeah, so. totally, totally. Yeah, I think, you know, earlier you talked about, you know, the, 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 how, you, not the interview process of what you're looking for in a vendor. It's really the same thing you're looking for in a client, right? Someone yeah. who's willing to have that, have that relationship with you in the same way. It's the same thing. The, 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 yeah. Those are going to be your best clients or the ones who, um, what I always like to say is, is my best client is, is the people who believe what I believe. You know, they have the same values and the same, you know, so the quicker you can get to that, the, the better, right? Like, here's what I believe in. If you do, then we're probably going to get along really well. Yeah. To me, to me, like the challenging part about the, about the, the beginning of the relationship is just basically piercing the corporate veil. Right. You know, I'm not here to prove to you that what you're doing should be improved or it should have been improved a long time ago. Yeah. I'm here to understand what it is that you're doing or what the company is doing, what you think you're really successful at. Let's look at there first. If, if you're successful at something and you can see small ways of improving something that you're successful at, then you're just complementing their own progress. And that's yeah. less, uh, I guess, obtuse or less intrusive to building that relationship. Or if you kick the tires and everything they're doing really well on and you come back and say, Hey, well, you know, I don't really see anywhere here we can improve this. You're doing a really good job. I also want to, don't want to turn myself into a weatherman. Like, I don't need to tell you that it's always sunny in Fairhope, Alabama. Like, that's not a job. <laughs> right. But I think validating what people are doing really well and showing them that you have the care and concern to go through their operation and see what they're doing well and say, hey, let's leave this alone. I'd like to focus on these three other things or you look at 2021's budget or you look at 2021's goals and you kind of get that as your jumping off point to see where you can help companies improve. And then if you're doing things that specifically focus on helping their goals, um, then it kind of gets everybody focused on the process instead of focused on the person that's introducing the process. You're already looking at workflow instead of like, well, who's this guy and what is he going to come in and show me or whatever? Yeah. Or, I hope he doesn't find anything wrong or I know we're doing a really bad job, but I know you can help us improve. Like none of that's really relevant. Yeah. You know, if you're an open business and you want to improve, then there's people out there like me that can help you do that. And the, the benefit of it is it's a temporary or possibly long-term relationship, but 
It's not GNA. You don't have to you don't have to put them on your payroll. You don't have to pay their bonus or give them stock options or give them health benefits. You don't have to do any of that stuff. It's simply a matter of you're buying perspective and experience for a temporary period of time. And as a result, it's gonna save you the trial and error process of trying to figure stuff out on your own. That's really how I look at it. Yeah. Well, I think that's a really wise way to, to view it. And, you know, obviously right now you've got some bandwidth uh, right right now. I, 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 you're, I assume you're probably pretty busy right now. There's a lot of, lot of things happening where people are trying to, you know, people are trying to save money. You're probably just contacting you because of that. You know, I, I have no pipeline right now, uh, but I'd like to clarify that by saying that I have four clients yeah, and all four of those clients were either referrals or based on, people contacting me and us exchanging ideas and then them seeing value in the ideas we exchanged and then asking me to come on board as a consultant. Yeah. So I don't really do a lot of advertising or mm -hmm. a lot of, I guess, cold calling or cold emailing or cold LinkedIn communication or any of that stuff. Uh, not that it's not valuable. I just, uh, I'm busy enough with the four clients that I have. Uh, two of them are ingredient producers, importers, and then two of them are restaurant companies. And um, I think four is good. I'd rather do four really, really well and be able to live with myself uh, or look myself in the mirror and say, hey, I'm doing the best I can for these four clients than having 10 and knowing that eight may not pay attention and I can get away with it. And two of them are really, really demanding. Uh, you know, I think that's a uh, I feel fortunate that I have the four that I have. And uh, after, you know, going through what I went through personally with Kona and watching that whole thing online and then moving up here and then watching the economy and COVID kind of, you know, take things sideways in less than two years, being in a position where my job is no longer available was, was kind of challenging, but I think, uh, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. And I was, I feel fortunate that, you know, Francis called me up and asked me to bid on the consulting job. And uh, from there, it's like, people ask me what, you know, you network all the time. You ask people what's going on, like what's going on in the equipment business or Andy, what's going on with design? Like, and then people always ultimately ask you the same, well, what are you doing? Uh, well, I did, I drove for Caviar and DoorDash for two months. And then I figured, you know, this is great. I'm out of the house and my wife and I aren't ready to kill each other, but there's probably something I could do with my time that's a little bit more uh, uh, commiserate with my experience. And then, you know, the consulting business started and here we are. Wow, so. that's, that, that's awesome. And, you know, I mean, you're, you're such a good resource. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on because I, I think you're, as I've often told you, and I say it publicly, you're one of the smartest people I know. And I don't say that, you know, facetiously, it's you know, that, that, that's what you're about. And you, I think you just proved that by the way you think and, and, and your thought processes. And it's pretty obvious that, that you'd be a huge asset for a lot of people. There's, there's so many smaller restaurant, really any kind of restaurant companies right now are, are, you know, as we all know, struggling. So, you know, having, yeah. having a resource like you is awesome. So we're going to make sure to uh, post your, your contact information on our, on our, on our notes section and all that, which I'm trying to get better at to, 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 to make sure folks know how to get a hold of folks, but thanks. Thanks for that. Um, well, one other question I want to ask you, we've been on for a while. But I want to ask you about kind of current conditions and what you think, um, if, if, you know, what kind of opportunities do you see in, in the near future as, as the world starts to thank goodness come out of, you know, the last, this, this 2020? Well, I think for the first time since 2008, we're really on in a clean slate environment, meaning, um, we're in a force majeure environment, which technically means all contracts are, you know, only as good as the word that both parties will keep to each other, yeah. you know, to the extent that they can, whether COVID impacted their business or not is, is really, you know, it's a case by case basis. But I think that, you know, we'll get heard immunity probably between October and December, or we'll have the, the psychological 
uh, pacifier that we will have heard of. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Nobody really knows. And that's the beauty of the human condition because, you know, the last pandemic was 1918. You know, you fast forward uh, 102 years later, we have a pandemic and look at all the technology and all the information and all the other Still crap that we have. Yeah. yeah outside of gravity and oxygen, which has been around for a long time, uh, you still can't stop a pandemic. So we're yeah. still human. And I think that, you know, resetting everybody's routine and getting people away from like being on your phone all the time or texting all the time or being on conference calls all the time has really given people the opportunity to sit back and say, what am I really doing? Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think with that clean slate mentality that as we start to emerge out of uh, the, the uh, unpredictability of the pandemic side and get back to what we think our new normal will be or whatever, that I think the people that have the same level of respect for their clients uh, from a B2B relationship or the people that value their guests from a, from a guest relationship, those companies are going to emerge not unscathed, but they're going to be leaner and they're going to be more focused on the simplicity of efficiency. You can have the best technology or the best marketing program or the best slogan or the best whatever. But at the end of the day, if you're in a food service environment, it's about the food. And it's about the beverages that you produce to complement that food. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that uh, smaller menus are going to benefit restaurant companies. Yeah. And I, I think that there's a value in that. If you spend $25 million a year on food and you've got 750 SKUs, there's really not a lot uh, that uh, some of the big players can drill into a, 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 an inventory like that and figure out how to harvest long-term sales. But if you're able to cut your menu in half or cut your menu by two thirds and really focus on the items that you know, kind of what Larry said in his call, it's the 80-20 rule. 20% 20 of your menu items are going to drive 80% of your sales. Yeah. Look at all those ingredients in those in the 20% of your menu items and see how you can engineer those items or or recalibrate or recombine those items to become different menu items. And then you're maintaining the same ingredient velocity without really having to bring in more ingredients or continue to uh you know, consume more line space because you have all these different ingredients you need to store. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that that's really where people are going to, and, and I also think from a guest perspective, guests who were, we're kind of spoiled in the restaurant business because there's so many restaurants, there's so much competition that the guests can really, they have so many different experiences that they really have high standards. I think guests are going to appreciate things a little bit more sincerely now coming out of COVID than they probably did you know, a year or two before COVID. Yeah. Not that their standards are going to lapse. I just think that they're just going to appreciate somebody being there to take their order or somebody being there to give them their, their QSR or takeaway food or whatever. And they also kind of feel like they're giving back to the economy. Cause I think that COVID's really, really beat the crap out of the, uh, out of the on-premise food service business for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I, I think you're right about all those things. I think you know, I think that those are those are good thoughts, and it makes a whole lot of sense. Kept you for an awful long time today. I, I don't want to keep keep taking all your time. Is there any anything else you want to chat about before we before we head out? No, I just uh, I think this was this was a good conversation, um, and I, I think that if people really want to do the right thing. Um, that it's easier to learn from somebody else's experience than it is Definitely. to learn from your own mistakes. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, it's an easier way to live. Yes, sir. Save you a lot of time and money in the, uh, in the process, right? Absolutely. Brian. Yeah. It's, it's so much that it's, I can't even write it down, you know, <laughs> No, but I, 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 I get it. what's that? Go ahead, Brian. No, I was just going to say a lot of the things that Chris mentioned today, I don't care what business you're in, whether you're in the procurement or whatever aspect, it was based upon really some trust, uh, relationships, um, having the same mentality. You know, you, you know, these things, these are transferable amongst industries. And it's all about, you know, I know Andy and I know Chris for a long time, you know, how you treat people, taking care of the people 
uh, taking care of your customers, caring about your reputation, caring about all the things that if you listen to Chris during the course of the time we've been on, they're very, they're very transferable to other industries, but it all comes down to, to doing a great job and, and trying to be the best person, um, chef, purchaser, uh, equipment salesman, designer, whoever it is. Yeah. But there's, there's a lot of, there, you know, there's a lot of transferable skills that you heard from Chris today. And, and I think that's been part of the reason he's been so successful for such a long period of time. So I, I've learned a lot. I just like to listen, but you know, I think those skills are certainly transferable no matter what you're in. Yeah. I mean, I think you just need to be willing to be too stubborn to give up and then everything else is just easy. <laughs> 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 well it was great seeing so, you chris really likewise was, i appreciate really the time and and andy thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this uh this uh, series and uh have you. i look forward to watching other ones and um you know hoping i hope you guys have you, a great weekend uh, hoping we'll see you you know we were uh, i was talking to some friends not you know a couple of days ago i was like you know the restaurant show is obviously coming up and you all you both know how much i enjoy that because it's it's like the time when i get to see you know so many people and i used to always try to convince chris to hang out with us at, at and he's always working with this with, with his different companies that he was working for maybe this year we'll be able to hang out if, if things look like you know and, and they're they're promoting it real heavy so i, I i'm stoked to be there if i can yeah, if there's a way that I can put put being out in Chicago on the radar, I will. Um, you know, Parker's based there, and uh, they got they just opened Orlando yesterday, and they've got two opening in Del Rey between August and October. So hopefully, my travels will get up get up to uh, Chicago during the NRA show. But if not, you know, um, I mean, I haven't washed your car in a while, Andy. I mean. <laughs> Brian and I never got to that level that if I washed Brian's yeah. car that, you know, Brian would then promote me, but Andy always did. I, yeah. <laughs> so if you have cars you need me to wash, I can always like, I could always add a stop, you know, near Fairhope. Fair you just drive your cars to the airport. I'll, I'll <laughs> wash them and I'll have like a three hour layover and then I'll get back on and either go to Birmingham or I'll go to Orlando. I mean, it, it's all possible. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get together and I love talking yeah. to you today and thanks so much for coming. Yeah. And thanks. Thank you so right, much. We'll, we'll all right, Chris. To you good talking brother. to you, buddy. Likewise. Have a good, good seeing you. All right, man. Oh, Brian, that was that was a good one, brother. I think that was a really yeah. good one. Uh, I enjoy talking to Chris. It's been so long since I talked to him. It's really good to catch up with him. Oh, he's uh, you know, again, I think he's everything we we said he was. He's has a diverse uh, portfolio of skills. He has a, you know, you know, really it's so interesting to listen to his career and the different, you know, people he's worked with in the business and all, and what they really, the impact that they had on him at every single stage as he's gotten, you know, as he's grown in his career and as he's gotten a little bit older um, and taken pieces, a little bits of the, of the best parts about him to make, you know, and then wrap that into what he is. But I really was, you know, again, I, the thing that's, that's most refreshing for me is, you know, however great uh, uh, that you are at your position and what you do, you know, again, talked about some of those core values in life that, you know, treating people well and trust and the value of relationships and creating value and all of those things that people really, uh, if they focused more on those things and whatever they did, they'd be wide, they'd be crazily successful. So, um, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I took those pre parts about, um, you know, Chris's success over his career. It's been, I really enjoyed it. Me too. Yeah. And I, I have not one word to add to that. I think everything you said was just right on point. So uh, awesome. Cool. So let's uh, see you next week, my friend, as always. Good to, good to see you. And uh, we'll talk, we will talk very soon. All right, my brother. Peace and love. Take care, bro. See ya.